Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to speak in English. I spent so long away from Kerala, so even though I read and write Malayalam fluently, my ability to speak in Malayalam is not as good as many of yours. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Sangeeta for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to speak to the department and also allowing me the opportunity to meet many of my old friends again, like Abhilash, uh, who teaches in the department, Mahmood, Vengiti, and uh, the others. One of the things is that when we study the history of Kerala or the literature of Kerala, it's important to remember that Kerala is part of a much larger world. Right? So when we study Kerala, much of what is written within Kerala history tends to be very claustrophobic. We study that strip from Kasarod to Kanyagumari and that is it. But Kerala is part of a much larger world that includes not only Dubai and West Asia, but as we go back further back in time, it stretches to the Roman Empire, it stretches to Southeast Asia. And those of you who have uh, read Benjamin's novels, for example, recent novels, know how much of Kerala's life and history is connected with West Asia. And those of you from an older generation and indeed in Malayalam departments who have read Vilasani Savagashigal, which is set in Malaysia, know also about the connections of Kerala with Southeast Asia and the settlement of Malayalis on both sides of the Indian Ocean. So the question is, why study the ocean? And this is a much bigger question than Kerala. Because we stand at a particular point in world history where we are thinking about global warming, where a 13-year-old, Greta Thunberg, has reminded the United Nations, in fact, chastised the United Nations for not thinking about climate change, global warming, and the untold damage we are doing to the environment. And this is what the novelist Amitav Ghosh has called the great derangement. That while we study, we do our research, we uh, write our fiction, produce our music, do our science, the fact that the world may come to an end through our very actions, through the action, uh, violent actions of human beings on nature, that we are not conscious, as we should be, of the fact of uh, the rising of the global waters and we proceed with business as usual. We do our BAs and our MAs and we produce books. Meanwhile, the waters are rising. In fact, metaphorically, we are standing in water up to our neck. And he calls this the great derangement, that a future generation will look on us and ask, why didn't we have the sense of urgency about the world at its point of demise? So in that sense, this is a, a large question, but it's also a very important question because most of you may remember the tsunami that happened in uh, 2004, which caused uh, tremendous loss and deaths in Sri Lanka. The tsunami did not turn the peninsula and come to Kerala. But what we're increasingly seeing is a change in climatic patterns in the Indian Ocean so that increasingly hurricanes and cyclones are happening in the western part of the ocean. So the next tsunami that comes may very well turn the corner and come to Kerala. And this is as a result of the larger climatic patterns that are changing. So this is both a big question but also a very immediate question that we need to be thinking about. The second thing is that for us, most of the work that we do tends to concentrate on nation states. You know, they're studying Indian history or we study regional history, the history of Kerala, the history of Bengal. But what is happening besides us is a much greater churning. Right? So if you look at the world around you, it is governed by migration. And that migration does not respect national borders, it does not respect passports, it does not respect security police. In fact, in 2016, when Syrians walked across the water to Europe, a million or more of them, the interesting thing about them is 95% of those Syrians who moved across the Mediterranean to Europe did not know how to swim. Around 80% had seen the sea for the first time in their life. So when you think about the pride that nations have, you think about the Citizenship Amendment Act, the attempt to close our borders to people coming in from outside, the various ways in which India is being defined as a nation, human will is much stronger than national states, their pride and the boundaries. So when we think about the movements that are happening across the ocean, it's not only the Syrians, it's the Rohingyas, right, who have been cast out of Myanmar 
We're thinking about an earlier set of movements of the Cambodians. We're thinking about the Sri Lankan Tamils who moved out of Sri Lanka during the civil war as the ethnic cleansing was going on. So what we have around us and beside us when we study our national histories and regional histories is this vast churn that is happening in the ocean. And this has been going on for 40,000 years or more, right? Ever since the first identifiable hominid left Africa and crossed all the way from Africa to Australia across the oceans. This movement has been continuing and we must take this into account and this question has become, as I said, more important because of the idea of the rising of the global waters. The third thing is that what are the implications, what are the consequences of doing history as we do? Are the histories of Kerala that we studied, that we continue to write, are terrestrial histories? Jenmangalam Patam, Chetram, you know, you know, this kind of where the whole historical insight is turned inwards onto land. What does this leave out? It leaves out the vast numbers of subalterns on the coast, right? It leaves out the fisher people, the Mukur. It leaves out the histories of those who came into Kerala from across the ocean, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. So what we have when we do a terrestrial land-based history is a Hindu history, right? So unconsciously what we end up writing is the question of Hindu, his, uh, Hindu uh, lives, in the history of Hindu caste, the history of temples, the histories of land and so on, not realizing that we are leaving out vast swathes of history because we cannot think about Kerala without its diversity of cultural population, what MGS Narayanan called cultural symbiosis. So this question of looking to the ocean is also to remind us as that Kerala has always been part of these vast movements from the first century AD, the first Christians, the first Jews, the first Muslims. One of the oldest mosques anywhere in India is in Kerala. Right? And date, dating, predating the Arab invasion of Sindh. So these are questions that we need to bear in mind, particularly in the time that we live in. Right? Where India is being defined in a particular way as a Hindu country, can we afford to write histories unconsciously right, in this Hindu mode? The second thing I want to say uh, is to think about the origin myth of Kerala. And we are all familiar with it. We, we are, you know, from the Kerala Ulpati and the Kerala Parama and then multiple texts that you could think about. If you think about that story, it's about an intransigent man uh, killing 21 generations of Kshatriyas and casting his axe into the ocean. The ocean recoils. The ocean recoils in horror at having to bear the sin of this blood. And the land of Kerala is created. The story goes on to say that this was populated by Brahmins who came in from Ahichatra elsewhere and so on and so forth. But how do we read the story for our time? Right? We are all familiar with it. One of the things to think about is that what the ocean gives, the ocean can also take away. And this is important to remember in the age of global warming. So if you think about cities like Mumbai, Calcutta, Florida, across the world, the clock is ticking for these cities. Present estimates are that by the year 2050, large parts of Bombay will be underwater large parts of Calcutta will be underwater. The city of Jakarta in Indonesia is already flooded and Indonesia has created a new capital. Right? So what we are seeing as something that is beyond the horizon, global warming, rising of the waters is there with us. It will happen in our lifetime. It's not something that our children and our grandchildren are going to witness. 14 out of 17 of the most important cities of the world are on the coast. 37% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. Think about all of these figures. So when the waters rise, and it's not going to make a distinction between the fisher people and the, you know, between the Mukwin and the Jenmi, everybody is going to drown once the waters rise. So we have to think about this as an urgent question. And there's an image that I would like to put before you, which uh, from the Kochi Biennale in 2014, and this is an image that I use very often, there's a Swiss artist called Mari Velardi, and she has this work, which is a room like this, painted entirely in blue, and there are these maps that she has drawn. 
of islands across mm. the world, Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean. And the title of the artwork is Atlas des Îles Perdues. In, in, it's in French, the Atlas of Lost Islands. And there is a date, 2071. So as you look at these paintings, some of these islands exist now. Some of these islands have gone underwater already. But by the year 2071, all these islands will be underwater. Right? And that includes islands that we know. It's not distant islands somewhere, islands in the Lakshadweep, for example. So this image should give us the sufficient urgency to realize that we cannot write history. We cannot write the history of Kerala as if it is somewhere in the middle of India. It's not Madhya Pradesh. We live by the coast. Right? And this is something that Parashurama's story reminds us. What the ocean gives, the ocean can take away. And this is happening even as we speak. The third point I'd like to raise before I go on to talk about some of the research that I'm doing right now is to use a word that uh, the great historian Sanjay Subramaniam has used, what he calls thalassophobia. That means fear of the ocean. Thalassos is the Greek word for ocean. So how do we think with thalassophobia and the Malayali Hindu imagination? And I use this word deliberately, right? When we think about the terrestrial histories that we write, as I spoke about, about agrarian hierarchies, about temples, about land relations, these are largely Hindu histories. They leave out the history of commerce, they leave out the history of fishing, they leave out the history of Indian Oceanic currents, and I'll come to that shortly. And this has also been occasioned by the fact that in the 18th century, when uh, Kerala comes under the control of the East India Company, and as Sardar K. M. Panikar said, the Indian Ocean becomes a British lake, there is a turn inwards. So Kerala, which for millennia had been involved with trade across the ocean, now turns inwards into land. There are the landed settlements, which are very similar to the Zamindari settlements in Bengal. You create a hierarchy of landlord, tenant, uh, landless labor, and all of the trade along the coast then begins to decline because of the East India Company's control over it. One sad story is that of uh, Ezekiel Rahabi, who was one of the merchant princes of the 18th century, one of the Malayali Jewish people from Cochin, one of the foremost merchants of the Indian Ocean. Within one generation, they become paupers. And his descendants are walking the streets of Kochi begging for money. Right? Ashin Das Gupta writes about this in his book. So there is a way in which the coming of the British closes off the ocean creates a landed imagination which is premised on a Hindu hierarchy and forms of caste get more and more entrenched. That's another history that we have to think about. But we also know that the co connections to the ocean continue. And very often we are distracted by ideas of Kala Pani, right? Restrictions on oceanic travel. The prize chitam that you upper castes have to do if they cross the ocean, even Gandhi, when he went to London to study, had to come back. But the world does not consist of upper castes alone, right? So when I was working in the India office library, the British library, I was studying a whole lot of manuscripts written by subaltern entities, by, uh, written by uh, Cheremas and Polias who had crossed the oceans in order to make their fortune, come back, build homes, much to the anger of the existing Hindu hierarchy. So there are a lot of these uh, books, pamphlets, which are probably around five to 10 pages each, which are in the British Library, called Basrapata, Pinanga Yatra, you know, which are stories of the travels made by local uh, lower caste groups. They come back, they build houses, but one of the things is that they don't have the same thalassophobia that upper caste Hindu imagination has. <coughs> So if you read these pamphlets, they are wonderful. You know, they, in their understanding of the ocean, there's the depiction of the glory of the ocean. There's the depiction of equality on the ship, right? An equality that they don't experience on the land. They write about how everybody in the ship mingles freely. The people talking in English, in Gujarati, in Hindi, in Malayalam, and so on. So it's a new world. It's like a, it's like a science fiction novel. They enter this capsule of equality as they travel. They make their money, they come back, and all over Kerala you will find these Burma Vilasam, Rangoon Vilasam, you know, all of these things that you see as you walk by on the road, but 
these are portals, these are windows into a much larger history that we need to write. Right? So this is the important thing to think about, these parallel subaltern histories of Kerala, which are constantly engaging with the ocean, bringing in the currents of the ocean, oceanic architecture, oceanic forms of oceanic food. So for example, the kinds of diet that people in Southeast Asia and Kerala have, the similarities with Sri Lanka and so on, there are various things to be thought about. The other thing to think about is the new explosion that has happened of late uh, in the writing of the history of Kerala, indeed of India, the engagement with what is called Indian Ocean Islam. And we have one of the finest proponents of this new history, Mahmud Kuria, sitting with us today. A whole lot of historians who have been asking the question, where is Kerala? Right? And what is the geography of Kerala? There is the myopic geography of the castle road to Kanyagumari. But if you look at the movements of traders, of pilgrims, of religious specialists, Kerala is much larger. It stretches across the ocean. The Indian Ocean Islam stretches all the way from the Hadramaut region in Yemen, all the way across the ocean through to Malacca in Southeast Asia. There's a vast territory of movement that is created. The circulation of texts, which uh, Mahmud writes about, the circulation of jurisprudence, you know, ideas of Islamic law, the circulation of music, with Ehsan Ihtasham is now writing about in the University of Chicago, and Yasser Arafat at the University of Delhi, I could multiply. And these are all the younger scholars who are emerging who are well-versed in Arabic, well-versed in Malayalam, well-versed in English, and they're going to change the way in which you think about the history of Kerala, where Kerala is located firmly within the ocean, not in this landmass that we call India, with its uh, imaginings. So the book that I'm currently engaged in writing, or have been engaged in writing, is called Thinking Beside the Ocean. And it's a study of the writing of history in Kerala from 1860 to the present. So why I call it thinking beside the ocean is also the idea that something is beside your head, meaning you don't think about it, but you're also thinking beside it, that Kerala is beside the ocean. And one metaphor that I like to use very often is from the Argentinian writer Borges, who says there are no camels in the Quran. And what he means by that, I mean, this is inaccurate, Right? But it's, he's a literary, uh, it's a literary illusion. What he means is that when something is so obvious, you don't need to mention it. And very often that is what has happened in the writing of the history of Kerala, that the ocean is there. And it's so there that you don't think about it. Right? And it's only off late from the 1970s onwards that people have begun to engage with the ocean. It's, every family is one member in Dubai. So for example, I'll be flying out tomorrow to back to Johannesburg, I'll stop off in Dubai. As soon as I get off at the airport, I start speaking in Malayalam. Because everybody speaks Malayalam. The Filipino, the Arab, the Malayali. So it's like going home. It's like become another district of Kerala. You know, the, the westernmost district of Kerala is Dubai. So how do we think about this thinking beside the ocean? And what does it mean to think Kerala with the sea rather than the land? And here what I'm doing is I'm taking a particular figures from particular historical periods and studying their work. And this has taken a long time also for reasons of, uh, you know, trying to keep abreast of the erudition of the people that I'm studying. And one has to get, get up to scratch as the phrase goes. So the first book, uh, which is some, a book that all of you know about, 1910, K.P. Padmanabha Menon's History of Kerala in four volumes. And we usually use it as a source text, right? So what are the sources for the writing the history of Kerala? And you go to K.P. Padmanabhamenon. But what is the curious thing about Padmanabhamenon's book? It is actually a series of annotations, as you, most of you know, to the letters that a Dutch priest called Jacobus Cantor Wischer, Jacobus Cantor Wischer wrote, writes to his sister. So there are these letters, very slim, which he writes to his sister, and K.P. Padmanabhamenon spends years writing annotations, showing how some of the observations are wrong, some need to be elaborated, and so on. And you think this is a very curious thing to do, Pavam, you know, Visha was writing to his sister, he was not writing a historical text, but K.P. Padmanabhamenon devotes like 20 years of his life to doing this. But the interesting thing about this is that what is, how do we understand this very, very curious fact which people don't seem to speak about? 
Right? Why should a mo one of the most distinguished lawyers of his time provide annotations for a forgotten priest's letters? So the interesting thing is that what is happening here, and this, remember this is the early part of the 20th century, the historical profession is still in its infancy in Kerala. So what he is trying to do is to think with Kerala as part of a much larger landscape. So he begins the history of Kerala thinking with Holland, right? Not with the Mughals, not with North India, not with East India, but immediately he is connecting up with this larger oceanic geography of Holland, the Dutch, uh, of Dutch colonialism, which stretched all the way from uh, you know, Europe all the way to South Africa and to Southeast Asia. And in many senses, this can be understood as a process of an initial introduction of the idea of history itself. Right? It's what Pascal Casanova, who is a literary scholar, has called in translation. Right? So if you think about some of the early novels in India, for example, uh, the influence of, this is something that again you might be familiar with, that a lot of the early novels in India consist of translations from existing English books. So, Sir Walter Scott gets translated into Bengali. When it, uh, Indumenon, uh, sorry, Chandumenon writes Indulekha, this is a constant confusion of, uh, so when uh, Chandumenon writes Indulekha, uh, he mentions Benjamin Disraeli's novel. Now, those of you who have read Benjamin Disraeli's novel know that there's very little similarity between that and uh, Indulekha, but this is a process of in-translation where there is this bow, right? Where you make this metaphorical bow to a tradition and you begin with that. And K.P. Padmanabhamenon's history of Kerala is very much like this. It is a bow to the ocean. It is a bow to the his fact of Dutch colonialism. And so I'm trying to think about this question of in-translation and the beginnings of a historical profession. But what is crucial for me is that the beginnings of the historical profession actually locates itself in the ocean rather than in the land, right? Or, a, or refers to the history of the ocean. The second figure is again a figure I've been working on for over 10 years and I still haven't got the full measure of him, an extraordinary intellectual, K. Balakrishnavilla, uh, who's <coughs> and Kesari Balakrishnavilla, as he's popularly known. And he was the one figure who introduced world literature and world history to Kerala. He was a man much ahead of its time. Uh, when Marcel Proust writes Remembrance of Things Past, within 10 years, uh, Balakrishnavilla is writing about it in Malayalam. This is an extraordinary fact, right? Because the first translations arrive in the 1930s. Scott Moncrief's translation, Balashnavilla has already read it. And in whether it's Scandinavian fiction, whether it's Asian fiction, whether it's European fiction, Italian futurism, he's there. And you think, how did this man who never really left his, left it with Angur, right? He was a homebody and a hypochondriac as well, rather like his hero Proust. Proust, at the end of his life, confined himself to a cork-lined room because he thought if he stepped out, he'd fall unwell. Balakrishnavilla was a hypochondriac who stayed at home, but the entire world was in his head. Right? So, one of the things that struck me when I was working in the Shaktandamiran library in Trishur, uh, an early text, and this is a phrase that I use very often, and it, in, in fact, it's the beginning of my historical research. Balakrishnavilla begins writing a series of articles on the history of Kerala, for Madhruvumi. And one of the questions that he says, he says, he begins the history of Kerala in Rome, in Babylon. Right? And this again, you think is a very curious thing. Like Padmanabha Menon looking to Holland. And why does he do this? Because for a thousand years, as we know, Kerala has been involved with this trade. It may not have been a major trade. Rajan Gurukul's recent book actually shows you the amount of trade that we have, which may not have been very significant, but there are these connections. So when he thinks about Kerala, he immediately connects up with the Roman Empire. Right? Already it's a much larger space that he's thinking about. And he asks a question which predates much post-colonial empire. He says, is Kerala a chapter in the history of Rome, or is Rome a chapter in the history of Kerala? This is a profoundly uh, insurgent and nationalist question to be asking. And what he does in this uh, 
process of writing this is to explore the myopia of nationalism so throughout his literary texts. And there are these, uh, there's a very eccentric remark where he says, Gandhi has advised civil disobedience and he's asked us to discard everything English. So I'm going to stop reading English fiction from right from now on. I'm not going to read Charles Dickens and Shakespeare. I'm going to read French writers, German writers, Japanese writers. But hidden in that eccentric gesture is a gesture of embracing the world and embracing the ocean. The third person who I've written about, but fairly long ago, again, some of you may have been may be familiar with this, uh, where EMS, uh, EMS Namburi Part writes Kerala Malayali Yolda Madhrabhumi. And it's again a very curious Marxist text which actually turns inward. So I use this text as a contrast. There is no ocean, right, in the 1948 text. There is no ocean in EMS's book because already India has become independent in 1947. There is the movement towards the linguistic statehood. Kerala will become a state in 1956, right, on November 1, 1956. So already the turn away from the ocean towards the land has begun. So the sea is more or less absent in his thinking. And there is a naturalization of land, the naturalization of hierarchy. There are Janmis and uh, you know, uh, revolting peasants and so on in his book. But it's a very, very uh, narrow history of a narrow strip of land. And this might be the shortcomings of the Marxist method or this might be the strength of the Marxist method because as we know, the communists transformed Kerala forever. Right? So, but this is a problem to be thought with. Then I move on to uh, looking at another eccentric figure. Eccentric figures interest me much more than the straightforward because if we work with the idea that history is that which is written by historians, it is what in English we would call a tautology, right? You know, <laughs> history is written by many others as well and certainly the rise of the Hindu in, uh, right-wing imagination has reminded us that it's not the history that we write and talk about in our rooms that is in the, out there in the popular imagination. So the person that I look at is Kanipayur Shangaran Namburi Pad, who as you know was a traditional uh, Namburi intellectual. He wrote uh, autobiography and he also writes a history, he writes his Atmagatha and then he writes Arya Mairada Kudiyata, which is a kind of four volume history of Kerala. The autobiography is interesting because it's an attempt to remember a lost world. Because by the 1960s when he's writing, uh, the Dravidian movements have happened in Tamil Nadu. In Kerala, the communist ministry has come into power. Within the Namburi community itself, you know, people like V.T. Bhattadari Pad, the Unni Namburi movement, Shangri Namburi Pad, all of them have transformed Namburi Manishinapya. You know, the, the, you, know, you know about all of that, right? So there is this whole process through which the idea of being a Brahmin has been undermined. So this autobiography is an attempt to remember what it was to be a Brahmin. And he has an autobiography in which he writes very little about himself. In fact, the autobiography ends not at the end, uh, towards the end of his life, but in the first 30 years, right? Even though he's writing it much later. And he writes about the objects that Brahmins used to use. Stylus, umbrella, marakoda, the palanquins. So he's, throughout the autobiography, there is a history of objects. Right? It, it reminds one of a line from T.S. Eliot. These are the fragments that I have showed against my ruin. So each of these objects reminds him of a time when Brahmins were dominant and so on and so forth. But what is interesting is that while the autobiography is a very landed, caste-based imagination, you look at Aryamara de Kudieta and it gives you a completely bizarre but interesting history of the, of the Brahmins. So he takes up the, and remember the phrase Aryan Marida Gudiata. So they, you know, it's connecting up with the history of the Aryans coming in. So the story, of course, begins in Central Asia. But then there is a twist. So the Brahmins begin their migration into India, or the Aryan, Brahmin slash Aryans begin their migration into India. But they don't come all the way through the land. They take a ship. And then they travel from the Gujarat region by ship to Kerala. Now, what is it? why is this interesting? Right? This is historically untrue. Right? But why does he write this history? Because one of the things is that if the Brahmins were to continue coming through land, then they're going to you know, do what uh, Chandumenon would have said that Brahmins do. You know, so this kind of licentious behavior, they would have interacted with the local population. 
uh, local women in particular, and lost their purity. But if they come by ship, they preserve their purity. Right? So this is uh, Kanipa Yoshangira Nambaripat's obsession. So he brings in this history of the ocean, connects the Brahmin, who will subsequently deny the ocean, right? Through the idea that the ocean is not to be traveled in. He connects the history of the Brahmins with the ocean, and uh, the idea of the Aryan invasion, which was central to the Dravidian, uh, Dravidian movement and rhetoric, is tamed here. Right? It's not an invasion, it's just people traveling by ship and set, coming to settle down in Kerala. It's a peaceful uh, colonization as it were. So there is this trajectory that I'm charting. And there are just two more things I'll say and I'll stop. Again, this is one chapter that I've written. So currently I'm working on the chapters on Padmanabha Men and Kane Payur. The other chapters have been written and published. The la last chapter in the book deals with M.T. Vasudevan Nair. And M.T. Vasudevan Nair is the Nair writer par excellence. Right? He writes only about Nairs. He writes about Taravadas. He writes about the kind of brooding Hindu kind of imagination. All the others are alien to that imagination. The lower caste is alien, the Muslim is alien. It's a very, very, very myopic small world that uh, Vasudevan Nair writes about. And the metaphor of the Nair Taravada becomes the metaphor for Kerala at large, or the fate of Hindus in Kerala. So you think about Iritinde Atmava or Nirmalyam, some, some of which you may have seen, the whole set of uh, questions like that, but what is interesting for me is what, what is the space that water occupies, right? Where is the water, right? And this is my search, right? When you think beside the ocean, you're constantly asking, where is the ocean? So in M.T. Vasudevan Nair's novel, there is no ocean except in that one novel that he writes, Arabi Ponna, right? Which is to basically say that across the ocean comes corruption. These guys go make their money and they come back and they upset hierarchies, right? And this was the feature of all our 1980s films. Right? When you think about those films starring Mohanlal and Mamuti, you would have people going and uh, making money in the Gulf and coming and buying the Hindu's land. And what is interesting, and if you go back and watch those films, at no point in those films will our heroes like Mohanlal touch the money. Right? Even in Nirmalyam, in the final scene, the Velchapada never touches the money. Right? It's almost like Hindus have this distance from money which the corrupt commercial classes of the Hindus and the, of the Christians and the Muslims have. So this kind of uh, Hindu imagination which M.T. Vasudevan Naya writes about, he doesn't write about the ocean. In his novels you'll find constant references to Bharatapura, right? which are obviously since he's from Malabar, but the Bharatapura is also drying up. Right? Central to the film uh, Nirmalyam is this idea of crossing across. Right? The, the Uninamburi in that actually walks across the Bharatapura and goes to the other side after making the Velichapada's daughter pregnant. So he's the corrupting influence. The river is run dry. What remains? It's the pond. It's the temple pond and the pond in the Taravada. That has become the focus. So from the ocean to the river to the pond, it's a dying of an imagination. Right? It's a dying of an imagination which has become, and it's a logical conclusion of a terrestrial history writing, and of a terrestrial imagination. And if you remember Adur Govarajan's Elipatai, the final scene, the Nair has to be woken up out of that obsession with the pond. He's thrown into it like a rat, and he comes out fighting for survival. Right? So in that sense, that empty Vasudevan Nair's novels reflect that closure that happens by the 70s where the imagination of the ocean has become the imagination of the pond. Right? And then you have the opening up that happens with the 1970s, the migration to the Gulf and the ocean comes back in. And now you're finally beginning to see a literature that is being influenced by that, Benjamin being one of the most uh, uh, important proponents. So I'd like to stop here, but then obviously when you look at this, you will probably say, well, this guy is talking about caste, but all he's mentioned are Nayars and Namburis, right? So all these figures that I'm talking about. So the two figures who I'm working on right now, who I shan't speak about, because I've just begun to work on them, 
And it'll take me one or two years before I can speak with any degree of confidence once I've read the work. The first, of course, is fairly obvious. Again, a figure that you will all know about. It's the first ever travelogue written in an Indian language. Uh, it dates back to 1790, Vartamana Ustam by uh, Paramekal Toma Katana, which tells the story of two priests who travel all the way to Rome to make a case for a local bishop to be uh, uh, instituted in Kerala. And it's a wonderful account of a voyage, you know, which also tells you something about the history of the ocean. Because they intend to go to Rome. Now, if you think about Kerala being here, Rome being somewhere here, there is an account of the storms that blow the ship all the way to Bahia, which is on the northwest corner of South America. Because the ocean is not, cannot be subordinated to human will. So suddenly, people who, the, the uh, Katanar who wanted to go to Rome, finds himself blown all the way to Brazil, and then they make their way slowly down to Lisbon and then to Rome. And in fact, it's quite curious that considering that they go all the way to meet the Pope, you would expect there to be some description of the Pope. He said, was a short, fat man with curly hair. That's it. And then they move on. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of that. So the Vartavana Pustayam again shows you the connections of certain communities in Kerala with the vast space of the in, uh, in ocean. right? And this is a fig something that we need to reckon with. And the work that I'm currently doing, which is very influenced by Mahmood and the new generation of scholars, is I'm trying to write something on Wakam Muhammad Maulavi and his uh, magazine Deepika. Right? And the argument that I'm making there is twofold. Because when you study the history of Muslims in Kerala within the Indian historiography, it's too influenced by the ideas of partition, Muslim communalism. Muslims are studied as a kind of hermetic entity, right? Muslims are studied as a community without any connections. So here you have uh, Vakamavan Maulubi who starts a newspaper, Swadesh Abhimani, which is edited by Ramarishnagulla. The two of them together through Swadesh Abhimani create a notion of ethical governance. What is it to have the rights of a citizen? What is it to have free speech? What is it for a monarch to ethically govern, right? So what they're doing is creating a democratic narrative, right? The Hindu and the Muslim together in a space that involves other Christian intellectuals as well. So that's one argument that I'm trying to make, that it's important to not study the histories of Hindus, Muslims, Christians separately, as if these are different planets, that there is this conjoined venture, which is what makes Kerala what it is, right? Kerala is not forged by any one community. But the second part of it is really where it ties up with the work on Indian Ocean Islam. Because Vakama and Malavi is also very influenced by ideas of Islamic modernism and what's happening in Cairo. So, in some sense, as the English phrase goes, Janus faced, where you look in two directions, right? Like the Roman god Janus. One is looking inwards to the corruptions of the monarchy. The other is looking outwards to Cairo and the movements of Islamic modernism which will recreate an enlightenment within Islam. So here again, Kerala is much, much, much larger than this narrow strip. All of these intellectuals are engaging with the oceanic world at large, whether they're bringing in Holland, whether they're bringing in Rome, whether they're bringing in Cairo. And hopefully at some point I want to work on Vilasani Savagashigal. I'll have to wait till my retirement because it is a huge novel, right? It's a kind of novel that you can only read when there is COVID lockdown and you have nothing else to do. But I will get there. But that will probably bookend this work or it may be a separate article because that brings in the history of the Malayalis in Southeast Asia because a lot of this, as you can see, is looking westwards. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope I haven't overshot my time. Thank you. I think this is an important question. It does not matter where you are, it matters how you think, right? I mean, you can be, can be uh, uh, some of the best works on Kerala. Recently, there's been a wonderful book written on Kodiyattam, right? How many Malayalis here know about Kodiyattam? How many of you have watched a performance of Kodiyattam? The best work on Kodiyattam is written by an Israeli scholar, David Shulman, right? Who has just published a collection of his essays. So, it really matters. The question is really of passion, 
right? So it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, etc. The second is, why does one write what one writes? And that's the second part of the question. For a lot of us, doing a PhD and doing, I know, teaching and writing books is a job that we do, right? And it's part of uh, employment, a profession. But for me, the idea of India matters, right? The idea of a certain India matters because of my parents, because of my teachers, because I've been influenced by people like Sumit Sarkar, Romila Thapar, who all fought for a certain idea of what India is. So when I write every word that I write, I have to think about an imagination that is an alternative to the narrow claustrophobic imagination that is being forced on us. Right? And we can do this more easily in Kerala. Right? My elder sister who teaches in JNU, Nivedita Menon, she has FIRs lodged against her. Every day the police are following her and you know, all, all kinds of things are happening. I'm less in danger. I live in South Africa. But remember there are a lot of people all over India who are fighting for that imagination of what India is. An equal, secular, democratic India. Which is, what, which is how we began. Right? which is how India began, which is what people gave their lives for. So in that sense, when I write about what I do, I'm very concerned that I try and think about India less along lines of Hindu, Muslim, Christian, but think about all of us who have made India what it is. And which is why I think with Waka Mahmud Maulavi reaching across the ocean to challenge a very, very strong repressive monarchy, or I think about uh, people like Balashnavilla who says that it's not enough to be a Malayali. Right? What, what does, uh, or to paraphrase an English poet, what do they know of Kerala who only Kerala know? Right? So we have to think and the third thing is the question of responsibility. Growing up where we do, we have acquired a certain tradition, a certain way of thinking in Kerala. How can we use that? And we have the freedom to have that thought where we see all religions as equal, we fight for justice. And what do we do with this? Right? And if you remember when the Shaheen Bagh protests were happening in Jamia, Jam who were the people at the head of it? They were Malayali students. Why? Because they carried with them this idea that this is not the India that we want. We want to fight for an alternate India. Right? So, I think there are many responsibilities that come with doing the subjects that we do, coming from the place that we do, and understanding that our academics is just a way of thinking about the world. It can't just be something that we do to get the PhD, the MPhil, or distinction in MA, or whatever it is. That's part of the story. So, in that sense, being outside and being able to write what I write, it certainly helps because I'm not under fear of arrest. And that certainly does matter to some extent. Uh, the first question was uh, with regard to the binary between ocean and land. So if we concentrate on oceanic history, are we then not looking at terrestrial history? The second question was about Padmanabha Menon and I thought a rather dismissive understanding of Padmanabha Menon that all he did was to translate faithfully what Jacob uh, Kantavishar did. And the third question is the relation between experience and, the, and writing. Right? So the first question, uh, certainly, uh, I think the reason for emphasizing that we need to write the history of the ocean is because it hasn't been done and it's only recently being done. This is not to suggest that we must write only histories of the ocean. Right? So you have the famous uh, uh, Caribbean poet, Edward Kamau Brathwaite, who wrote a wonderful novel called the Ari, Les Arivons. And he has the notion of tidalectics, that there is a, like dialectics, tidalectics is the constant relation between land and the water. And coming from the Caribbean, which is an archipelago of islands, it was quite obvious that th this is an idea that would appeal to him. So in that sense, we have to have this constant connection between the ocean and the land. You can't write the history of one without the other. See, the other thing is that you, if you otherwise, you could also end up writing a purely sentimental history of the ocean as a space of freedom, right? That you can escape from land and get into the sea. And that, of course, is not true, and there are you know, multiple counter examples that one could provide. With regard to Padmanabha Menon, I think you're kind of selling him short when you say what you do, because what is interesting about Padmanabha Menon is 
while at one level he is working on the translations of the letters, he is actually creating a historical method at the same time. So when he disagrees, agrees or extrapolates or elaborates on any of the aspects in the letters, he is asking, how do I do this? What are the sources that I could look at? What constitutes a source for me to... So you, through those letters you are getting an understanding of a much broader cultural history of Kerala, the sources that you could look at. He is putting himself within the space of colonial ethnography, colonial history. Right? Sorry, you had something to say? No, because... See, Cantabish's letters are this much, Padmanabh Menon's work is four volumes, right? That all that he writes is from Herbert Beery. Right. I'll, no, that's not true. Anyway, that's a much larger discussion. That's not, that's not really true because he depends upon the whole, uh, the colonial archive, the colonial gazetteers, the colonial ethnographies, he depends on uh, Paranjalul, he depends on customary histories. It's an extraordinary work of scholarship. Uh, you know, they, they might, you might make the argument that he also refers to Guri's work, there I would agree with you, but it's a much, much vaster enterprise. But then anyway, but we can have a larger discussion later. The relation between experience and writing, you know, there are uh, many of the departures in the writing of history have come from an emphasis on experience. So, for example, when somebody asks the question, where am I in the history that I am reading? Right? It's a fundamental question to ask. So, when I was teaching in Delhi University, a lot of students who came from the northeast, from Naga, Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, they'd say, you're teaching us a history of mainstream Indian nationalism. Where are we in this history? So, then I had to get up to scratch, read, and then we, I supervise many MPhils and PhDs and so on. But if you think about the progress of history writing, this has been the fundamental impulse. Where am I in the history that I'm writing? This has produced feminist history from the 80s onwards. This has produced a Dalit history from the 70s onwards. Then you could go on. You could, but this question of experience also creates a problem. It creates, if you follow it along a certain path, it leads to a certain kind of division that emphasizes that only women can write about women, men can write about men, Dalits can write about Dalits, Muslims can write about Muslims, nobody else can. And obviously that is not an argument we would like to make. Because what we need to do is to build that bridge. Right? Experience is about conversation. See, if you think about Gadamer's idea of hermeneutics, it's about a fusion of horizons. That is where the politics is generated, where I reach across to you and our horizons fuse and then we create a new vision because otherwise we can create these small ghettos within which we write to our own community. To give you an example of where this can lead, and interesting, if you think about the United States and the way in which employment works there, if you are a South Asian student, and I've been teaching for over 20, 25 years in India, a lot of my, are bright students. This is the fate of teachers in India. They're bright students leave, right? They don't stay. So a lot of these students go to the US to study PhDs in history, political thought, and so on. And they want to study Adam Smith. They want to study uh, the French Enlightenment. But they're gently nudged in the direction, oh, you're from India, you know, language is so well. Why don't you work on India? So, the question of authenticity, the question of experience is then perverted, right? Where it is only the South Asian or the Indian who can write about India but cannot write about anything else, right? And so, I mean, there is no obvious answer to the question that you're saying, but I'm just pointing out the field within which we need to think. That this can be a hugely limiting experience if one makes this the end point as a point at which to begin descent, it is essential to ask that question. Where am I? Where is my experience? And that is what has generated the powerful work of people like Gopal Guru, Sharmila Rege, Aniket Zaure, and a whole host of scholars who have written about caste, or indeed in Kerala. Right? I, mean, I don't need to mention the scholars in Kerala who have uh, 
done this kind of work, Sanal Mohan being one of the first, you know, one of the most important people to have done that. But I'll stop here. Uh, now I'm willing to take as many questions as I'm allowed to by the establishment. I should have mentioned both N.P. Mohammed and M.T. Vasudev Nair because I don't think, I think that novel Arabi Punna could have been written by N.P. Mohammed, by himself. M.T. Vasudev Nair by himself could not have written that novel. I mean that M.T. Vasudev Nair does not have the experience to be able to write about that whole uh, history, culture and the uh, histories of oceanic trade. Right? When you think about Parapanagadi and all of these places, they're all connected to the ocean in various ways. And M.T. Vasudevan Nair by himself could not have written that novel, which is why it's a joint novel. Yeah, so I completely agree with what you're saying. I completely agree with what you're saying. The question of what are the archives, right? I mean, so I think there is a way in which the obvious answer would be that we have not mined our archives enough. Because our focus has been entirely on the land, we have not used the colonial archives or the existing archives sufficiently because there is enough in those archives to, be al to allow us to begin to engage with the histories of the ocean, of navigation, of exports, of groups associated with the ocean and so on. So there's the existing archive which we can use, then there is the expansion of the archive. So for example, the work that uh, Mahmood is doing, Yasser is doing, uh, which is to look at the kind of texts, right, which circulate across the Indian Ocean, which tie up local Islamic jurisprudential traditions with traditions that exist in West Asia and Southeast Asia. So you have the wonderful work by Rona Trichy, the Arab cosmopolis. So there's the textual kind of uh, archive that we can draw upon. The third archive is slightly more elusive, which is the sonic archive, right, where for example, when I went to uh, the uh, Ajmer, to the Darga, and I heard them singing in the desert, what I hear in the song is the sounds that come from across the ocean. So sitting in the desert, surrounded by nothing but blazing stand, I can hear the ocean, right? They hear the movements of the Sufis who have brought this music here, and so on. So this is what Ehsan Ehtisham is doing, right? When he studies the Padapata and so on and so forth. The other kind of archive that we can draw upon for the ocean which, is stamped, which looks at the connection between the land and the ocean is uh, something that uh, you know, uh, the um, seafarers of Malabar, K. R. Sunil's photographs, right, which, uh, are, which was displayed at the uh, Kochi Biennale where he uh, interviews and photographs all of these uh, people who were on the boats who travel, who spent their lifetime cruising along the uh, western coast of India and each of them tells a story which is about the sea, right? And the sea is that which inha they inhabit, right? So they some, sometimes want to travel down from Bombay to Kerala. The boat is adrift. It goes all the way to Dubai. Then the man goes. He settles down, marries there. Then he comes back. Right? It's like that uh, wonderful film, Venkiti would remember, uh, uh, Mizoguchi's film, uh, what is it called? Uh, you know, where there's a man who goes to war and, the, and then he falls in love with a ghost and then he comes back to his wife and it's almost as if nothing has happened. Uh, the name of the film will come back to me. I keep thinking Ugetsu Monogatari, but it's not that. <coughs> yeah, one. So this thing of uh, Sunil's photographs, which actually show you the lives of people who are in the ocean, and it consists of oral history, it consists of conversations. So each of these, there is no source. One of the ways in which we are traditionally uh, taught history is that you are told, okay, uh, you come for your MPhil or your PhD interview, they say, what are your sources? Right? And people say, oh, we will go to the Sakai, we will go to Kori we will go to Patranadatta, or wherever, whatever it is that they will do. The problem really is that it is the question that determines the source. Right? Sometimes you may ask a question for which there is no obvious source. And that is the struggle that Padmanava Menon had, these early writers of history, where they asked, so if I am to write a history of Kerala, what constitutes a source? 
And of course, we have become much more sophisticated in our methods where we draw upon sound, we draw upon words, we draw upon you know, a multiple variety of sources. So, for example, uh, the excellent work that's been done on the cassettes, right? The uh, songs that, uh, the letters that were exchanged between those who migrated to Dubai and their wives, the cassettes that they sent to each other, that's another source. So, I think it depends very strongly on the question that you ask. And that question creates a, uh, a circle of sources around it. So, if you ask the conventional question, how do I write a history of nationalism in Kerala, you might end up uh, with the standard sources. But once you ask the question, how do I connect the ocean to the land, then like Balarishna Villa, the entire world becomes a source. <laughs> you just have to read everything. Which is why I find it so difficult to write about Balayashna Villa because I constantly feel I'm 30 feet behind him. I will never catch up because of the amount of reading that he's done. So, but it's an important question. What are the sources? And I think each person will have to determine that. Yes, exactly. A reimagination of the discipline where we stop, stop thinking with it, these disciplinary boundaries of literature and history and psychology and film studies and so on and so forth, that everything has to be grist to your mill, as the phrase goes. Right? 